The Untold Stories of Fort Myers is being made possible in part by Bill Smith Appliances, the City of Fort Myers City Council, the law firm of Goldstein Buckley Seckman Rice and Pertz, the Lee County Government County Commission, and the Lee Trust for Historic Preservation. Johnson. Welcome to Southwest Florida History Untold Stories. Today we'll be exploring Fort Myers. Located nine miles upstream from the mouth of the Caloosahatchee, Fort Myers location puts it in the center of the Southwest Florida community. We'll hear stories of war and peace, prosperity and depression, and see how rivers, rails, and roads played key roles in the development of Fort Myers. Join me as we learn how the small military outpost of Fort Myers rose to prominence in Southwest Florida. The small military outpost of Fort Myers was originally called Fort Harvey, named after a soldier who died in 1841. Uh, Fort Myers was originally a fort called Fort Harvey, uh, uh, where they defended against uh, the Indian uprisings in the uh, Second and Third uh, Seminole Wars. And then later it became a uh, northern uh, fort during the war between the states. Forts are usually named after uh, generals who have done a great deed. But Fort Myers are named after a brevet lieutenant colonel who has actually held the rank of captain. His name was Myers. Uh, and uh, he was engaged to the general's daughter, so the Fort Myers was built for a man in, and named after a man in love. The fort was manned by 300 African American soldiers, the United States Colored Troops, and they participated in the Civil War around 1863 to about 1865. My great-grandfather came to Fort Myers many times when it was Fort Harvey as a dispatch officer uh, during the Seminole Indian War. And as soon as the Civil War was over, then he moved into Fort Myers and moved into one of the officers' quarters and remodeled it, and he lived there for many years, right downtown on the river. Downtown Fort Myers was actually where the fort was located. A lot of people think it was in one building, but actually it was a good-sized fort, 140 acres. In 1866, the first permanent settlers arrived in Fort Myers. They came from Key West, the county seat of Monroe County. There was no Lee County. This was all Monroe County, the biggest county in the United States. It only had two towns, Fort Myers and Key West. Of course, the county seat of Monroe County was Key West, and uh, there was a big uh, feeling that we should be separate on the mainland from the Keys. It became incorporated in 1885. My grandfather was one of the incorporators of Fort Myers. He and 44 other gentlemen sat down, and he signed was the incorporation papers of the city of Fort Myers. Fort Myers had its first school uh, in the early 1880s, but some student apparently had some fun and burned it down. And to get the commissioners, the Lee County Commissioner, or the, excuse me, the Monroe County Commissioners to build a new school for them, they had to travel to Key West one, one week to go down there and come back. And of course the commission said, look, you let a student burn it down, you go build one yourself which angered the 350 citizens of Fort Myers. And eventually, in two years, they rebuilt the school, but they also became Lee County, named after General Robert E. Lee of the South. We became a separate county, uh, Lee County, in 1887. And Lee County at that time included both uh, Hendry and Collier County. And Collier and Hendry County got broke off later on. Um, in the, the, the 20s. As the town grew, so did the need for communication. The city's first newspaper was established in 1884. 
The Fort Myers Press came to Fort Myers as a result of a Shanghai. Uh, the man who had loaded up his boat with his printing press uh, was destined to go to Fort Ogden. But the uh, people on the boat never went up the uh, Charlotte River. They instead went to Fort Myers, up to Caloosahatchee. And they tied up, and then all the townspeople who were aboard that boat, including the captain, who were wise to what was going on, went ashore and got the local townspeople to decide, yes, they could afford to have a newspaper here in the town. So they went back aboard the boat and talked the editor of the paper into coming ashore and setting up his print. And the first newspaper came out as the Fort Myers Press. It later became the news press. And it was news when world famous people discovered Fort Myers. Edison came to Fort Myers uh, from Bunarasa uh, in search of bamboo. He came up and he found the bamboo and uh, immediately signed a contract to buy 13 acres uh, 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 just south of uh, downtown Fort Myers. And that 13 acres is what uh, became Seminole Lodge. The community really didn't want to participate in any of his inventions, like it's, it's alleged that he offered to electrify the town, but the town was afraid of the lights would scare the cattle, so uh, they didn't permit it. Uh, I don't know if that story is true or not, but it's, pretty per it's a pretty pervasive story. We did visit Fort Myers in 1928 and apparently did uh, meet Thomas Edison uh, as they arrived in Fort Myers and of course being young did climb up in his lap. With the coming of Edison uh, other people were attracted to it. Henry Ford came to Fort Myers uh, because of his friend and mentor uh, Thomas Edison and uh, he came uh, first in 1914 and I brought John Burroughs with him. Hoover came to Fort Myers in the 20s to, to visit Edison. By 1885, when Edison came here, it was a thriving metropolis of 850 people. And then most importantly, with the coming of the railroad in 1904, made it double in a, just a few years. The uh, railroad was the main part of transportation that took and freighted uh, stuff out of the Lee County, like gladiolus, potatoes, uh, etc. that they grew in Lee County. In the early 20s, Fort Myers switched tracks from rail to trail. The Tamiami Trailblazers, they called themselves, was a group that was organized in 1923. The highway was going to connect between Tampa and Miami by the East Coast. It had, I believe, about 13 Model T Fords and about 23 people and two Seminole Indian guides started out left here on the 23rd of April. And uh, they thought they'd have about a two or three hour, or two or three day drive across, because it was in dry season, and it took them 23 days to go across it. See, most of the Indians, when they cut uh, trees to get through with, they had ox carts and they cut them off to the height the ox cart could go over. But Model T's couldn't, and they had to do an awful lot of cutting. My daddy was about to take me, but I was only, I don't know, about eight years old. Meanwhile, the city's downtown area continued to evolve, attracting merchants and retailers. When my father and his uh, three brothers came here around the turn of the century, uh, they opened up a barbershop on First Street and they charged 25 cents for a haircut, 25 cents for a shower, 25 cents for a shave, 25 cents for, sh for shampoo, and 10 cents for, for a shoe shine. And their biggest day that they made money was on Saturday when everybody came to town in Fort Myers. And they'd be open from 6.30 in the morning to 10.30 at night, cutting hair and taking care of their customers. Don't tell Frank, but I didn't go to his barbershop. I went to one of the competing barbershops. Uh, uh, but uh, 
That was the barber shop that took care of Henry Ford. Henry Ford uh, had his hair uh, cut by Frank's father, but it was quite an institution. Uh, some of the best stories in town were told in the, the Pavish barber shop. And you'd go down there on, everything stayed open late on Saturday because they closed at noon on Wednesday so people could go fishing. First Street was a popular place on Saturday evening. The store stayed open late and um, everybody in Fort Myers was there. People worked hard in the early years of the last century, growing their businesses with the community. My grandfather, Charles A. Powell Sr., he uh, was superintendent of the Seminole Ice and Power Company uh, for many years. Uh, it was kind of a central power source for the city of Fort Myers, and it also manufactured ice. They had railroad cars that would come in there daily, and he would load the ice, uh, and his crew would load the ice on them. And uh, everything back then really uh, revolved around ice. It was one packing house, uh, several of them, downtown Fort Myers. They were on the edge of a rail, a rail a railroad track, so people could, you know, utilize the uh, loading of the freight cars and then moving them, transporting them to other places in the world. I remember very well going to Fort Myers and working in packing houses till two o'clock in the morning after I got out of school and working in packing houses and coming home and then going to school the next morning and getting up. So there was difference in, uh, in, in the way you could work children at that time. I was only 12, 14 years old. The fishing industry in Fort Myers, as it existed then, uh, there were a number of way stations and uh, uh, trucks would go out in the morning with 300, 300 pound blocks of ice, uh, deliver ice to each of these fish houses and bring back fish uh, to the central location in Fort Myers. When it was time for entertainment, the Arcade Theater was the place to be. I went there on Saturdays and for 11 cents, uh, I think it was 11 cents, we could uh, go into the theater and see the serial and then uh, the movie that followed. As a child growing up, mom would put us in the arcade theater as little boys and say, and nine cents, I think, bought you a ticket to get into the uh, in this, uh, arcade theater. So various different ones of us would go in and sit together. And, and at that time, the, the people uh, that run the program would uh, almost act like policemen to us to make sure the children, because they had uh, they had children's times where they had children's movies and then they had the adult movies, which is always a, a Western, a serial, always had a newsreel. My dad used to be a projectionist at the Arcade Theater downtown. And Mr. Edison used to come in and he had a certain seat where he would sit that was rigged with a hearing aid for him. And he would, that's where he would always go to the movies. The Arcade Theater always had MGM's best movies. The singing and the dancing, and it was air-conditioned. You had to go outside and down the arcade to get your nickel bag of popcorn. But that was okay because the guy at the door knew you and he'd let you back in. The Arcade was probably the first air-conditioned movie that was, that was in Fort Myers. I understand, but I, I, I've never seen it, but I understand that they actually had huge blocks of ice up on the roof with a huge fan blowing the cool air down. While the movies attracted a big crowd Saturday night, Sunday morning found many of the same folks in church. Religion played an important role in the community's development. Well, the religious development in the early days, people had more time for religion. They were closer to nature. A lot of them had their farming or their gardens or whatever. That's just part of early settlers. They, they had to live off the land. You had the Methodist Church. On First Street, you had the Presbyterian Church on Second Street. You had the First Baptist on Second Street. You had the Catholic Church on 41, at St. Francis was on 41. And there were several other churches on the outskirts of Fort Myers. Those are the ones that were downtown that I can remember. Of. Churches were always a part of our life. You were, you were automatically involved in a church if you had any social 
a desire to be around people. And upholding the law of the land, the people of Fort Myers had a police force that was proud to serve and protect. Well, I think one of the major, major items of history with regard to the police force was the story about Matt Heisler uh, being shot. Uh, Matt was the first policeman of the city of Fort Myers to be killed in the line of duty. He responded to a call uh, for a domestic quarrel and a man shot him in the thigh with a shotgun. And two days, this was in 1930, about two days later, due to the tra trauma that the body felt from that shot, he died, a story that uh, had been long since forgotten. As the community grew and Florida became increasingly popular as a winter destination, baseball found its way to the city of Palms. Baseball in Fort Myers is a very interesting beginning, and the first Kiwanis Club in Fort Myers in 1922 decided they'd bring a big league team for spring training to Fort Myers. And after a little bit of talking and so on, they finally got Connie Mack, Cornelius McGillicuddy, the real name, but always known as Connie Mack. He owned the Philadelphia Athletics, and he brought his team here for spring training from 1925 to 1936. Baseball has always figured big in the development of, of Fort Myers. I think it's given, it, early on, baseball gave Fort Myers kind of a national um, voice and uh, was probably instrumental in some of our development. And like much of the South, football fever became part and parcel of the local culture. Football began in Fort Myers uh, with uh, the building of the first all, all uh, high school students in a building. Otherwise they shared the building uh, at one time with junior high school students and at one time with anyone from K through 12. My dad played football in the mid to late 20s for Fort Myers High. Played quarterback. He was quite good at it, made all state. And I had a lot of people tell me when I was growing up how good he was. Girls made their mark too. I can recall as early as, uh, I would say 1925, 26, that uh, at Williams Academy there was girls basketball team and they were very good, very good. Mr. Dixon, who was the principal, was the coach. Then playing St. Petersburg one, 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 uh, one afternoon. And of course, St. Petersburg being a big town and coming to a little country Fort Myers, they thought they were gonna come in here and just wipe Fort Myers out and it was the other way around. And I remember this little girl, one of the players from St. Petersburg, and I guess it broke her heart to think that they had lost this game here in Fort Myers. And she was sitting there on the edge of the porch at William Academy and she was crying and crying. And for years I felt sorry for her. <laughs> for years, actually. <laughs> in 1929, the stock market, which had driven development throughout the country, crashed. The Great Depression had begun and Fort Myers was hit hard. I had a dairy, I, I, I mowed lawns, I did any, any kind of work I could get to get a nickel. And, and that's what kids raised in Depression hard times will do. Most longtime residents recall school days as happy days. I started off in kindergarten in the county barn, which was on the courthouse square on Broadway. It was a, had the county road equipment downstairs and upstairs. The kindergarten was on the west end and the uh, city band room was on the east end. And uh, then I went to the uh, bungalow school on Royal Palm through the first and I guess second grade, and then went down to Gwyn Institute. Went to school there through the six. Going to school here was uh, was a wonderful experience. Uh, we lived in Edison Park, and Edison Park School was a block away. We could walk to school, and uh, we used sometimes we you know we would we would walk to school. They'd make us wear shoes, but as soon as we got out, the shoes went off, and and uh, we spent a lot of time barefoot in Edison Park. During that time, Fort Myers was like 
had a city in a city, Dunbar Heights. First Safety Hill, then Dunbar. Was the other city in Fort Myers. It was the colored town. We had our high school, a wonderful marching band, great football team. Clubs and organizations that students participated in. During the school year, there were plays and musicals and operettas and a wonderful social life for children growing up. In the 1940s, Fort Myers was among one of the top producers of gladiolus in the world, and the Boy Scouts took advantage of that. It used to be that when you would ride down McGregor, you could look off in either direction and see just fields and fields of gladiolus, and they were beautiful. The gladiolus was the capital of the world. As you went into, into Lee County or into Fort Myers area, you seen a sign. It was a beautiful picture of a gladiolus. We sold, as Boy Scout, we would sell gladiolus. One of the growers would give us uh, gladiolus, you know, the, the coals, and then we'd go door to door selling gladiolus as, as fundraising projects. The Boy Scouts uh, taught my generation, uh, as they are teaching today, uh, how to get along in life. I, I've used my training every day since uh, I left scouting. Uh, it helped me through the Navy. World War II came along. Young men who had recently worn scouting uniforms now found themselves dressed for combat. And during World War II, they had two big air bases here. One at Page Field, they had airplanes at that one, and I think they had some B-24s there. <clears throat> and at uh, Buckingham, they had the Buckingham Air Base, and I, I was just a young man, and I helped build a Buckingham Air Base. And, 1942. In World War II, Page Field, which was, uh, after all, it was the tail end of the Great Depression, and they had not been able to build a good runway. And, and one airline, the National Airlines, said they wouldn't come here anymore unless we built a, a concrete runway, which we couldn't afford to do. But then, all of a sudden, we were in World War II, and the Army came down here and they put about a million dollars into runways all over the place because they had to land bombers here, B-24s as well as all the other airplanes. So uh, World War II gave us a real good airport which was used by National Airlines. World War II had a, had a great economic impact on the area. The, um, the, we were just coming out of the Depression and with the establishment of all the military bases in the area. There was an influx of money, there was an influx of people uh, that came here to be in the service, came back after the war was over to marry local people and, and to raise families in Fort Myers. During World War II, uh, I remember we were living, we lived in Dean Park, and I grew up there and we had a large home, four bedroom home. And one day a young girl was at the door talking to my mother, pleading with my mother. And uh, next thing I knew, that girl was living in one of the upstairs bedrooms and with her husband. And her husband was stationed at Buckingham Air Force Base, and, uh, or the Army Base, and he was soon to be shipped out overseas. And they were newlyweds, and there was no place in town for rooms to rent. And uh, it seemed like a week or two later, the, another bedroom was rented, then another bedroom, till all four bedrooms were rented. And my, father and my mother and my brother and myself, we ended up going on the back porch, which was enclosed. And uh, the final result was the living room and the dining room with curtains hung was rented out also. And it was kind of an extended family. You got to know everyone. And uh, years later, uh, a lot of those uh, people came back and visited after the war was over. It was quite rewarding. Oh, I remember uh, when the war was over, a big time celebration, and my uncle took us all downtown. Uh, we stayed there till after midnight, and uh, that was a big deal. Through prosperity, depression, and war, Fort Myers would lead Southwest Florida through the first half of the century. But once again, it was advancements in transportation that would lead to Fort Myers' next growth boom. The next evolution in transportation, from rail to road, and from road to air were about to arrive. 
The next time we visit Fort Myers, we'll see how the arrival of I-75 and a new airport would change Southwest Florida forever. I'm Matt Johnson. Thanks for joining me in exploring the untold stories of Fort Myers. Fort Myers has just been, I think it's sort of a utopia. All my classmates, we get together and talk about it, and we decided we grew up in paradise. We were so happy. Uh, you know, it was like a, it was like a picture postcard type existence. I think what was special in Fort Myers is it was small at the time and everybody knew everybody and it was a lot of camaraderie with everybody. You, you, you knew all the people that you grew up with. My life has been good. I wouldn't trade my, my childhood growing up in the area that I grew up in. Well, Fort Myers uh, has always been my favorite place to, uh, to be. I've never harbored any thoughts of moving. I think at Fort Myers, uh, it's rich in history, and uh, if people would just uh, attend, uh, visit their local museums and uh, historical societies and visit them, introduce themselves and get acquainted with the deep, rich history of Fort Myers, it's very rewarding. To order a video of this program, call 1-888-824-0030 or visit our website at wgcu.org and please refer to the program number on your screen.